Hi, is this the Kingdom Hall? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, yeah, I was just doing some phone witnessing. Do you have a minute? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I was just doing some phone witnessing. Do you have a minute? Oh, yes. Oh, great. Um, can I share a scripture with you? Oh, um, this, are you a sister? Do you mean a Jehovah Witness? Yes. Oh, no. Oh, okay, because this is, uh, you just called, this is the landline for the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses in Rockville Center. Oh, I, I don't mind. Oh, okay. Can, um, I, can I share one scripture with you? Sure. Um, would it be okay, um, of course, your scripture, if I would be able to do the same? What? Uh, after you share your scripture, would it be okay if I did the same? Oh, absolutely. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, this one is uh, Romans sixteen seven. Mm-hmm. I love this chapter because Paul is referring to a lot of friends, a lot of people that helped him. I and I'm a woman, so I love how he talks about women that uh, actually helped him financially, and they were like mothers to him and things like that. I just love that. But anyway, th- this verse seven says. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who were of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Um, So I was just wondering about that expression, in Christ. Uh, He refers to when they became Christians as being in Christ before him. Um, Do you guys ever use that expression? Because it's very biblical. If you look up in Christ, you know, that is how it describes Christians. You know, he didn't say, had become a Jehovah Witness before me or is in Jehovah. Well, um, with regards to that, we Mm -hmm. don't use the expression that you just said either. We usually say something like, when they came into the truth or when they became a brother of Christ. A brother of Christ? Yeah, the New Testament doesn't use those expressions. I was just wondering why you don't use the Christian expression of of people who are Christians. Like, um, here's another one, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. It says, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I could also add to that if uh-huh. you look at what Matthew twenty-eight, nineteen and twenty says. Right, the Trinitarian baptismal formula, which you guys don't really use, do you? So we do baptize right. in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. No, Jesus they never Christ say says. that, and they add, and you're dedicated to the organization. I, I heard it myself one time. Uh, Jesus I, didn't mention an organization. I mean, I'm looking at the scripture Uh right now. Right. So I could read it aloud. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of people of all the nations, Uh baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. Right. And look. At at baptisms at the conventions, they do not say that. They do not recite the baptismal formula and... You know what else is interesting? I've noticed when they have it in articles and things, they usually leave out in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They put an ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. Did you ever notice that? I wonder why they do that. Because that is so important. It's how Jesus said to baptize. And the earliest Christian writing called the Didache mentions it as very important to say. As, as a formula. That's the first existing Christian document that we have. Some people think it's from the first century. And they just leave it out. Here it is in the recent November study edition. Go therefore and make disciples, dot, 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 teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you, period. Could I ask what um, version you're referring to? Um, King James. This is great. I like to compare different ones sometimes. 
No, it's on your website, the King James Bible. I've read. What version of scripture is that? The King James is a translation. It's on your website. Oh, well, yes, we do. Our primary translation is the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. But for additional study reference, we also have on our website, if you look, the King James Version, right. the American Standard Version, the Byington Version, the Kingdom Interlinear. So our main translation, the one that we use, uh, edited and published, does have baptizing them in the name of the Father right. and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I know. But why don't they? Why do they quote it, misquote it so many times? You can't put a period and then the quotation mark if it's actually not the end of the verse or the sentence. And consistently, you'll notice this. They put, go therefore and make disciples, dot, 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 teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. Now, that's, that's a very important omission there. See, because it's going to remind people of, of what other Christians believe. And wouldn't it, I mean, this is just me personally mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. speaking. In quotes in general, wouldn't you, I mean, even just using like text-based evidence, like if you're reading a passage for a, a quiz or a multiple choice question or a, a short response, wouldn't you contextualize the quote and then use the section of the quote that pertains to the message being given in that moment. So when, uh, so using that as a parallel, if I were trying to teach someone about scripture, the focus in that moment wouldn't be the path to baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but rather what we're doing in that moment, which is the attempt to teach them, which is why the focus in certain quotes would be teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you, and in other circumstances, the ultimate goal, baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because Um, I'm sure if you were to look up, on our website, we do have an encyclopedia of sorts. It's our Watchtower online library, where if you were to look up the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you would find a host of resources where we use that section of the scripture and a host of resources where we use the teaching them to observe. Well, the thing is on that... Depending the context I, okay, I, I, I of get, the article or yeah. paragraph that it's being used for. I, I get the point that you're making, but considering that they purposefully use misquotes to kind of lie or obscure the source that they're quoting, a really famous one that people talk about is the one on the cross. Actually, several on the cross where they leave out the most important part, which would actually disprove what they're trying to show. Would you like to see see that one? Now, with the cross, I do have a personal point about that. Uh-huh. It would be important to note uh, and again, this is me personally uh, speaking. The Bible also does very clearly state that no image should be used as worship. So regardless of the tool on which Christ died upon, it should not be used as a symbol for religion, a symbol of Christianity itself. Can a watchtower be used for a symbol like that or... Or a blue sign that says JW.org? So it's an identifying mark. Oh, I see. But there's okay. no one no praying one, before. Right. No one worships the cross JW. either. Org, or no one's saying. Right. No one's praying before a sign of the watchtower. Right. It's just no an Christians worship the cross. And I actually never heard of that. But that's just this kind of thing. They, they make up stuff like that. But um, it's in the, what where the cross misquote is, is called in the Imperial Dictionary, the Imperial Bible Dictionary. And um, it's in the reasoning book. And so you can look at the dot, 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 and then you can look at the Imperial Bible Dictionary, which is, I'm pretty sure you can get the PDF online. And um, you can see what they left out. 
So okay. there you can what see is... the point is not just to quote what they're talking about. It's to purposefully deceive. Are you allowed to do research outside of the publication? Oh, I mean, of course. I mean, me oh, okay. personally, like, just personal background-wise, I'm, like, a historian of education by nature, so I love looking into the archives and, like, physical documents, primary sources, secondary sources. Oh, excellent. Have videos. you read studies in the scriptures? So, in terms of my theocratic background, I've only been in the in the truth in the organization for I, I because I okay I'll, I'll give you the honest truth I'm 18 I've only been a student been baptized since 2013 mm -hmm. so the length of my study you got baptized in two wait you got baptized seven years ago and you're 18 yes so you were 11 I was 11 did you understand shunning and and what is happening to so many people today suffering because they got baptized as a child? And I understand the, the struggle that people have. No, I, I'm asking, did, you, did they talk to you about that when you were 11 and make it clear that if you did do research, which mentally you couldn't have done at 11, if you did your research later and find, found out about their true history, scandals, child sexual abuse cover-ups, and so many other things that people are finding out now that there is the Internet, that you, your family would never talk to you again. I know a man who has never seen his three grandchildren. Well, I, I am aware of all And he's that. not evil. So that's just bunk. That broad brushing of them as out having orgies and doing drugs. That is a total lie. He left because of two things, really. Um, the misquote on the cross was really huge for him. And then the cover-up of pedophiles in the congregation, which he actually saw with his own eyes. And then he researched it and found how much stuff was in the news and how much they have a reputation for that now. So that is why he left. And now he can't see his grandchildren. And I, and I understand that perspective. I'm asking, yes, did you understand it when you were 11? Well, when one gets baptized, it is an expectation, and at least for myself, one that I did uphold for myself to make sure that I fully understood the the background, the history of the organization itself. Oh, you, when you were 11, I, you knew a lot about the history? You mentioned original sources. What original sources did you read about their history? Since when you read their books about their history, they leave out so much. So what original sources were you reading when you were 11? So I apologize, but with all due respect, although I was 11, 11-year-olds still have the capacity to read, understand, interpret, and analyze sources, since that's something that they're taught. So that's number one. Outside sources? They don't even let you read Christendom books. If you try to give a Jehovah Witness a gospel tract that's just scripture, they won't take it. If you try, I tried to give a witness a quotation from now, their own literature, and they acted like it, was, it had the coronavirus. Now, here's the thing. I hear a lot when you're speaking, you say a witness, the witnesses, a congregation. That is, their information Our, control policy is well known and well documented. So in terms of a personal approach to things, I have read academic resources, like I can actually hold on. Hello? Yes, I'm still here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Did you read Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin? So, in terms of my approach to things, is I try to go at them from a strictly academic basis. So, rather than 
reading personal memoirs of those who might have left the organization or were just fellowshipped. Very or... important to consider. Very important source. Since on the FAQ questions on the website, it's just filled with lies and omissions. Do you shun no. former members? You know what the first word is? No. Well, that's just a total lie. And now anybody can research it. And and former members, they're a, an important source of information. And yeah. they can also point to scholarly sources. I mean, the whole Trinity brochure, they don't emphasize it as much anymore. It's filled with misquotes. So then... Did you, did you look up that. those, too, the sources? Because they use a lot of dot, dot, dot in those also. So they're getting you to see that, that to, to think that the quote means something entirely different than what it really does. And that's been well documented. And you can look those up. I know a woman who, who just left the organization who is a lawyer, and um, she was able to access actual hard copies. And she looked up every one, and she said it, it's they're very slyly and obviously mis, misquotes. That's why they don't – it's still on the website, but they don't emphasize it anymore because that was so exposed by researchers. So that would be a good research for you since you said you like scholarly sources. You can find all those books and, and see if they're quoting it properly or misquoting. So that, that would be important, you know. And I agree with that. So Good. as you just stated, rather than personal, I mean, even with, like, news and media, there's going to be sources that are opinionated, that have a personal charge to them, and then there are going to be sources that just tell you the root of things, the source of things. Right. Actual, that, yeah, that could happen. based mm -hmm. truth. So rather than me looking at, as you, as, as you just mentioned, rather than me looking at sources that would point me to other things, I would rather just go straight to those other things. Yeah, the so original, look the at the source. original sources. There's nothing wrong with that because they, they are quoting them, you know. So exactly. obviously the Watchtower writers read those, those things, so it couldn't be wrong for you to read them. And I don't disagree with that. I think it yeah. would actually be of an added benefit. Oh, yeah. It will be real eye-opening for you. Mm -hmm. It will benefit you. That to really get a more holistic perspective Oh, definitely. On. Yeah. So, like, I mean, even just as a personal study project, what I've always tried to do is when I look at Scripture, because of the fact that there are so many people that don't take Scripture for being accurate, or for being the word of God. Oh, that's true. That, yeah, that's something true. Something that I do is I try to look for those connections from scripture to historical precedent, scientific accuracy. So, I mean, just a couple, like, if you see the book of Job, talks about uh, the world being ground. The book of Isaiah mentions not explicitly the word gravity, but the concept of it, saying that the world is suspended over nothing. If you look at specific examples of artifacts and coins that are found and mentioned in the Bible, those are things that not even archaeologists found until much later that really prove right, the right. historical veracity of the Bible. So Yeah, for example, for example, they Bible said, itself, yeah, for example, they said so-and-so never existed, and then they found they did, exactly. whether it was kings or historical people mentioned or or other things um, they used to say just because they hadn't found it yet. Now, the so Book of Mormon is totally read, different. They can't find anything that relates to that, <laughs> you know. So along that same thread, just as I use historical and scientific and archaeological background to kind of further prove the veracity of scripture, something else that I am, that I have been working on personally is also using those same historical sociological tools in order to further the veracity of 
interpretation of that scripture. Yeah, yeah. That's why the looking up those, are, I love how you say original sources and using them. So that would be a great project for you in the Trinity brochure. And definitely the quotation on the cross in the reasoning book. You know, get the books and just compare what it is, is obviously saying to the parts that they leave out strategically, very strategically leave out. Could I mention one more original source that's really interesting? Um, you know that they say that Jesus chose them and re- pure worship was restored in 1919. I, I read that on the website. That, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that, that, okay. w- that would be true. Okay, so the book that they were distributing at that time during that inspection and when Jesus chose them is called The Finished Mystery. So that would be a great original source for you to look at. Can you can you get a copy? So, like, The Finished Mystery, uh-huh. uh, Studies in the Scriptures, I know there's seven volumes of them. That's right. all, I mean, just for me, like, I know that's available on our, because we have two different sources, just because of the, large amount of information any publication that we've published from if i'm not mistaken 1950 to the present is available on our watchtower online library right but right. anything from like the beginning of that so or like anything that people like brother russell or brother rutherford right. or brother nor that wrote like eight, like late 1800s to the right. present is right. available on our cd rom which is also available for online download on our website as well if you just personally wanted to see those sources oh okay yeah i think that when um pure worship was restored and when jesus chose them would be very important to research what they were teaching at that time because they teach that it was on the basis of the spiritual food that jesus chose them so the finished mystery would be a really interesting um original source for you to look at I know they get new light and all that, but it's a little bit difficult, uh, almost impossible to get away from the finished mystery because they said well, Jesus I was mean, I choosing them. A very quick example. Um, so do you understand? If- excuse me. Do you under- Do you kind of follow what I'm saying? Why that is crucial? Oh, I do. Okay. Like, I can okay. mention an example of something that would I think would go along your thread of thinking. Uh-huh. Have you ever seen? Uh, tomb. Seen what? His tomb, like where he's buried. Oh, yeah, with the pyramid? Yeah. Yeah, so you, like, obviously, his core belief in, like, the Pyramid of Giza as a symbolism of the sanctity of Christ and the, like, hierarchical order of the organization of God uh, and there being, like, certain steps and him wanting to symbolize that with what he's buried in, that I know... I believe is discussed at length in either volume seven of studies in the scriptures or in the finished mystery. Uh I haven't read, I can't point you to a specific page because I don't know exactly where it is, but I believe it's in one of those two books. So of course there are examples of, if you look at like Jehovah's witnesses and some brothers believing that the end was going to come in 1914. Some brothers? Wait, 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 wait. You said, some brothers believe that? Or was that their teaching? I think Isn't that what you mean? Well, don't so, say some brothers. That's how they reinterpret their history. Let's say that it was taught throughout the world by Charles Taze Russell before 1914. And his claim was they did call him the faithful slave, and he, it calls him in the finished mystery the final, the seventh and final messenger of the church, the Laodicean messenger. He said these are God's dates, not ours. Okay, so he did. He no, did claim inspiration. That, like, so thread, don't say that. My... Don't say the brothers believed that. Say the slave taught that. Okay, just just a little correction there in the in the words that you're using. And along that same thread, if you look at the history, I think it was up until Brother Nor, where there was like a president of the Watchtower Society, where they were like a continuance of the faithful and discreet slave, and that has changed since then because of there's been and as it says in scripture a clarifying of the light a brightening of the light where truths are clarified according to new understandings 
That's another word they use a lot, clarified. Russell said that new light can't contradict old light, but over their history they've done that many times. And they're just like, new light, new light. So, I mean, they can even change things like it's proper to worship Jesus, which they taught until the 1950s, to it's it's, um, idolatry to worship Jesus. That's not new light. It's a whole different religion, actually. 